before we get started, um, just wanted to really quickly introduce us and uh, who we have with us this evening. This is Stories on Stage Sacramento, a literary performance series going for over 10 years now, thanks to Sue Statz and mm -hmm. Valerie Fiervanti. Um, I am one of the co-directors, Dorothy Rice, and Shelley Blanton Stroud is in a box somewhere. Say hi, Shelley, our co-director. And uh, Jessica Lasky is our casting director. Hello. And Sue Statz is our, our person emeritus who does everything and keeps us on track. And we are so happy this evening to have Alia Vols um, with her wonderful book, Home Baked which I know for so many of us is bringing back lots of memories. Um, and it's a wonderful memoir and history book. Wow, really good. And um, our actor this evening is Megan Pearl Smith. Welcome everybody. I'm so excited to have her here. Um, it's great to have Alia here because you probably have read some of her background. You know, she's a terrific author. She is, I don't know if you know, she's a wonderful literary citizen. She's perceptive, charming, and completely disarming. What a great guest for us to have tonight. Thank the very so first much. time I met her was at the Community of Writers, and Sue Stats was here at that same time. And um, I was just literally charmed by her many ideas and totally unique way of seeing the world and have just been thrilled to see what's come of all of this uh, immersion she's done in writing. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, background about her that you can look up easily, but I'll make sure it gets said. She's a homegrown San Franciscan. She's the author of Home Baked, My Mom, Marijuana, and the Stoning of San Francisco. She's the winner of the Golden Poppy Award for nonfiction from the California Independent Booksellers Alliance. And here I'll say that, um, Speaking of independent booksellers, we're going to be posting ways for you to buy Alia's book. And through Green Apple Bookstore in San Francisco, you can get a signed copy, copy if you haven't already. I'll also say that I did such a great job of selling your book to my children that my son took my signed cop copy with him to Madison, Wisconsin. So <laughs> anyhow, um, she's a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in Autobiography. Her work's been published in the Best American Essay, the New York Times, Salon, the Best Women's Travel Writing. Her family story has been on many places, including Fresh Air. And my personal favorite, that her mother's brownie recipe has appeared in Bon Appetit. <laughs> so my dad is like, just go ahead and keel over right now. You got all you need. Um, there's lots more in addition to that. Those are kind of like the big splashy things, but there's lots of interesting things in addition to that. In the prologue to Home Bake, she, she says something that I see has been quoted quite a bit, but I think it's really useful. She says, I had been my mom's accomplice since I was in a stroller. Before I could spell my own name, I understood that I came from an outlaw family. And I just love that sentence appearing in the prologue. So I, I kind of wanted to ask you, how does this outlaw status affect the kind of writer you are and the kind of choices you have made? Oh, uh, that's a great question. First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for having me here, Shelley. Uh, and and uh, I'm probably I'm going to derail this completely for just a second to say that the the night we met, we had a very memorable meeting at Squab when we were all. I'm just going to go ahead and say it: drinking too many Moscow mules. That is true. <laughs> because it is cocktail hour, I am having a Moscow mule. Oh, yay! <laughs> uh, and uh, but I love that it comes for full circle. And you just said that that your copy of of my book went to Madison, where my book begins. Also full circle. That's where my mom's from. So anyway, I, I love I love how in the literary community we can just keep cycling through, and these relationships can can go on and on for years. Um, and, and keep coming back into our lives. So thank you very much for, for having me here and continuing that. Uh, so as for the, the outlaw thing, I mean, it's really, it's really core to my understanding of self and my place in the world in the sense that in, in my family, I was raised to perceive us and me as a good outlaw, which is to say, 
kind of an outlaw for the people, someone who's doing things to help the community that are also judged by the powers that be. So it, it was a, a strange way to go grow up in some ways. There were, of course, challenges to having to keep secrets and being feeling like an outsider as a kid is, of course, difficult. But I also learned to think critically and, and question authority at a very young age. And those that that kind of outsider status that lens is is a really powerful tool for a writer so i think and any kind of artist really so i think it informs um well every decision i've made in my life really but it informs a lot of my work as well great you know thinking about again with the the you and your writing um, you're so immersed in literary communities. I know that you're kind of at the beating heart of San Francisco's literary scene, really very in there. And, but beyond, beyond San Francisco and so many residencies and conferences and, and relationships. And I'm gonna invite you to talk about the positives of that, but also the negatives. I, you know, we mentioned that we met at a writing conference and I believe the reason we had too many Moscow Muse meals just because we were super anxious it was very stressful and not every it's not like everybody loved what I wrote you know and it was mm -hmm. it was difficult so I was kind of wondering what would you tell I, I think we might have some writers in the room so I oh and I see we have Amanda McTighe who shared those Moscow meals with us that night and maybe even Joyce Salter I can't see the list right now but more mule drinkers um <laughs> But I was wondering what you would tell writers about the role of being a literary citizen and, and feel free to say not only what the joys and benefits of immersing yourself in the literary world, but also the particular stresses. Like, are, are there every times that you need to step away and clear your mind of all those other people? Yeah, uh, that that's a that's a great question, and you make some good points there. Uh, writing is a is a solitary act. I mean, to complete a a big old book, you have to spend a lot of time isolated, one way or another. Even if you're in public, you're isolated, uh, and preferably you're in some kind of a basement, and people are slipping pizzas under the door. You don't have to talk to anybody. Um, but at the same time. Art doesn't happen in a vacuum. So this exchange of information and support and ideas is so important to me personally as a writer. I, I need it. I have a writing group. We meet every other week. And I feel like I would be dead in the water without that, um, both because of the critical feedback, but also the sense of, of community and not being alone in what is essentially a lonesome uh, process. So that, that community is vital. And if you abandon your community and you're not, you're not there for people when they need support, well, you'll find yourself alone when you need support too, um, which I, I guess makes it, makes it sound more self-interested than it is. I mean, it's, a, it's an honor and, and a joy to participate in an artistic community. Uh, I do find book promotion, especially uh, in these modern times, so much of it happens online and our, I'm, I'm in the traditional publishing world, of course, and, and we get a lot of pressure to push our books on social media you know, we have to do it, but writers are not necessarily <laughs> these public people, you know, uh, by nature where we're, we work alone. So, so there is a push pull and, and I find that I have to kind of fall out of, I have to fall off the internet for days, sometimes at an inconvenient moment, because I just have to. Um, but, but for example, my, <laughs> my publisher recently asked me to start making TikToks. TikToks, <laughs> TikToks. So um, yeah, so I'm uh, I'm doing that, and and I and I feel I feel ridiculous, you know. But at the same time, I I will I will do absolutely anything to to help people meet this book. Uh, not just because it's 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 my my book and my work, but because it tells the story of so many people who I feel indebted to in this community. So. You know, we got to, it's part of the job, right? 
That's great. I wanted uh, to ask one more question and then we're going to, uh, Jessica will introduce Megan, our actor tonight. Um, you're, you're providing a workshop tomorrow and that workshop still has some openings. Uh, it takes place in Pacific time, one to 4 p.m. So you could go ahead and register tonight or tomorrow morning and still participate. It's only $50. It's like the best deal I've seen. And um, But I'm really taken by the topic. You know, in memoir, questioning everything. And almost at, at one point in your description, you say something like taking a whodunit approach to the writing of memoir and, you know, how, feeling okay with having questions that may not get answered. So I was kind of wondering before we hear this excerpt tonight performed by uh, Megan, I was wondering if there's any question that lingers for you after the work of researching and writing this book. Is there something that you're still chewing on and working mm. out? <laughs> uh, always. I mean, I feel, oof. if we settle all the questions, there's no magic. Uh, and that's that's really that's something I believe in personal writing. It's not just about leaving space for a sequel. It's, it, there, there are no, there are no final answers, you know, and I feel, I feel this way about life in general as well. I feel this way about spirituality. I'm, I'm not somebody who wants a final conclusive answer, right? So in, in the world of, of Home Baked, I think that I could probably come back to the same material 10 years later and have a whole different set of questions for it, uh, which is what I think makes personal writing so dynamic um, and, and kind of bottomless because you can come at the same problem from countless angles. And, um, and there's, there's, really, there's really no end to the wonder and, and mystery of of the mind, right, and and the memory. So, so of course, I, I I don't have a really clear lingering question because I kind of I spent a really long time hammering them out. Yeah. This, but get back to me in ten years. I'll have I'll have a whole different version of it to discuss. Although I hope to be writing about other things for Pete's sake. But. <laughs> well, I would think that part of it is that. Your, uh, your memoir is set so specifically in a particular place and that place is changing. Mm -hmm. And because I follow your mother on uh, social media, she's fantastic. And I know I have seen the artwork that your father has recently done. It's that you're, if you write about family or if they're tangential to your ongoing memoir, they're changing, mm -hmm. they're evolving. They're not the same people that you know, not just exactly the same people as they were in the book. Not at all. And, uh, and they actually changed quite a bit in response and in relation to the process of writing this book. So there's a Schrodinger's cat situation. You know, you can't, you can't write a memoir about someone without changing their lives also. Um, it, you know, that, get, that can be thorny of course, in a lot of, in a lot of families. And I've, I've been fortunate that in my family, the changes have by and large been extremely positive. Um, but definitely family is an ongoing project. <laughs> and maybe it's partly because your parents are artists also. Mm -hmm. So they might be more amenable to this kind of thing. Although when I look at things like Philip Roth and his relationship to his biographies, I mean, authors aren't always that amenable to uh, people describing <laughs> their lives and their work. So, well, what a delight to hear some of those questions answered. And, and now I would like to introduce our casting director, Jessica Lasky, who will introduce our actor, Megan uh, Pearl Smith today. Yay, I am honored. I'm very glad to be here again for another event and very glad to get to introduce you all to Megan Pearl Smith. Um, who is a wonderful actor, also a wonderful person, and a master gardener, as we were just discussing. So <laughs> um, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Megan, um, but also if you want more information, we did a pretty in-depth interview on the Stories on Stage Sacramento website. So if you want to hear her 
very deep thoughts about the whole acting process. She's just, she's a fascinating human. Go ahead and check out that interview. Um, but just some basic information. Um, she is an actor and musician based in Davis, um, but she's worked all over the place um, over a many year career. So she's worked at Capitol Stage, Sacramento Theater Company, California Shakespeare Theater, Tahoe Shakespeare Festival, San Francisco Playhouse, Colorado Shakespeare Festival, and many, many more. Um, and she is also, if you could hear the music at the beginning, um, she's half of the band Meisner and Smith, um, which is with her partner, Sam Meisner. They have wonderful, wonderful music um, that they call their own brand of story-driven, harmony filled acoustic folk rock music and it's just fantastic music so i've put their website in the um, chat so that everybody can check it out but it's meisnerandsmith.com um pretty easy but definitely go ahead and take a listen to them because they're fantastic so um without further ado i'm going to turn it over to megan for the reading thank you so much jessica <laughs> All right, welcome everybody. Here we go. Excerpt from Home Baked, Blind Fate by Alia Voltz. Meredy bloomed into the role of outlaw entrepreneur. Stepping out on the, on the wharf in no, November, 1976, weighed down with marijuana brownies for sale. She felt her energy crackling dangerously a stripped wire. Her reputation began to precede her. Oh, you're the brownie lady. Among her new customers, there were several fine men to flirt with. She had fair weather boyfriends here and there, hey baby free love romps, and the occasional awkward orgy, but nothing she could hold. Granted, she was choosy. She wanted a knockdown, drag out transcendental romance. She didn't go for the buck jaw, toothpaste, teeth, harmonica, mustache look that was mainstream then. Creative, slightly broken, effeminate types gave her the butterflies. Forget Burt Reynolds, bring on David Bowie. She considered herself an artistic genius and was, at the very least, an artist of significant promise. Therefore, she wanted a lover of the same ilk, a Diego to her Frida, a Rodin to her Claudel, a man who dealt from a full deck of cards, preferably not tarot cards. But whenever Meredith felt a genuine connection, the guy backed off. She had a knack for both dazzling and terrifying the opposite sex. As one of her customers would recall decades later, she was a striking lady. Kind of terrifying to tell you the truth. Despite possessing intelligence, good looks and cojones, or maybe because of these traits, Meredy drummed her fingers in fern bars on Clement Street and cafes in North Beach, waiting. Her best friend, Barb, kept saying they needed to find her a magician. He's here somewhere, Meredith thought, somewhere in this seven mile town. He was about three miles away. The man who would soon become my father walked the mission toward what he didn't know. He liked to be on the street, checking people out, getting checked out. He stood an even six feet with good posture beaten into him at boarding school and moved with an easy long-legged swing. Music in the wooden heels of his cowboy boots striking the sidewalk, rhythm in his hips. On a clear day, he was the kind of guy who would try to stare directly at the sun and meditate. Once burning his corneas so badly, he had to wear gauze patches. He walked destination wherever, soaking in the scene. Passing the 16th Street BART station, he checked out the men in high-waisted slacks and bandanas, the women selling tamales. The crowd surged and ebbed. Occasionally, he'd see another freak coming the other way. They'd lock eyes and nod, a current passing between them. He could get overloaded with energy, like a circuit breaker receiving too much juice. 
He'd been trained to read auras, and sometimes he couldn't turn off the colors enveloping the strangers. He liked the smell of grilling meat, the sound of the ranchera music, a little circusy to his ears, the funk of junkies, the occasional rainbow of a kindred spirit. He walked, feeling alive inside his skin. We are all one light, he thought, all the world's children. Barb was the one who found him. Her burly carpenter boyfriend had moved into an enormous warehouse on 20th and Alabama streets in the mission. I'm living with all these kooky hippies, psychic hippies, he told her. You won't believe my housemates. Barb liked kooky psychic hippies. She visited the new space and that's where she met Doug Volts. Doug told her he'd graduated from the Berkeley Psychic Institute the prior autumn, earning the grandiose title of ordained reverend of the Church of Divine Man. Barb had never heard of it. Doug explained that they had trained students in clairvoyance, aura readings, chakra readings, telepathy, and telekinesis. When he mentioned that he'd painted a mural of all the graduates who preceded him in exchange for his tuition, Barb's ears perked. Oh, you're an artist, she said. Come right this way. He directed her to sit in a straight-backed wooden chair facing a triptych of canvases about seven feet tall and three feet wide. The central panel featured a life-size woman with long blonde hair sitting on a wooden chair and staring frankly out at the viewer, palms resting on her knees. I call this piece, My Old Lady is a Dancer, Doug said. It might not look like she's dancing, but sit with her for a little while, see what happens. Barb could feel Doug eyeing her for her response as she tried to relax and focus on the painting. A green field stretched toward barren trees behind the seated figure and filled the other two panels. Puffy clouds drifted across the intensely blue sky. Doug's style was photorealistic. The detail was so fine that she thought he must have painted with the tiniest brush imaginable. But there was something otherworldly about the image, too. She looked at the woman's calm brown eyes and the painting began to move. The grass swayed, the blonde hair twisted in the wind. Oh my God, Barb thought. Doug and Meredy are going to be together. By early November, the Sticky Fingers Bakery was running low on magic ingredient. Meredy sent a letter to Mumser her source in Humboldt County, saying that she was coming back for another visit. She didn't hear back right away, so she and Barb decided to drive up and take their chances. The season had been dry, the drought deepening, but a soft welcome rain fell that afternoon. On the way up, Barb, Barb told Meredy about the handsome psychic she'd met. I got his number for you. I can't call this guy out of the blue, Meredy said. I've never met him. Oh, come on, Barb said. What do you have to lose? She cajoled. But Meredy dug her heels in and changed subjects. They drove four hours only to find that Mumser had harvested late and was still drying her plants. She didn't have anything ready to sell. It'll be all right, Mumser said. Plenty of us up here. She put a call out on her CB, which growers used to track storms and wildfires and notify one another when law enforcement was prowling. This is Mary Widow, she said, winking at Barb and Meredy. Anybody got eggs for sale? Got friends up here looking for eggs. Over. Eggs, a code word, apparently. The radio was quiet. Then a voice broke through. Affirmative, Mary Widow. I got some eggs. <sharp inhale> Mumser drew a complicated map, which Meredy and Barb followed down unmarked dirt roads into the deep woods. The rain swelled 
from a sloppy drizzle into a downpour and liquefied clay streams streamed from the roads, exposing hunks of rock and giant potholes. They ground up a precipitous hill, then sharply down. At the nadir, a roiling brown creek cut across the road. Someone had laid two planks across the surging river water. Barb hit the brakes. I don't know about this. If we go into that creek, we are screwed. Her 1966 Datsun pickup didn't have four-wheel drive. If they got stuck, they'd be marooned in the deep boonies. Miles from any phone booth, they'd have no way to call for a tow truck. It was a narrow road. On one side, snaky black roots laced a tall clay bank. On the other was a sheer drop into the woods. An ocean of pines and redwoods rolling into the gray distance. There was no room to turn around. No chance of backing up the steep hill. Nowhere to go but forward. Barb exhaled slowly. <sighs> promise me you'll call this guy, and I promise you we'll make it. Meredy gave her a sidelong look. It's a deal. Barb patted the dash, and Meredy white knuckled the door handle as they eased towards the creek. Milkshake brown water licked the boards. Barb kept her foot steady on the gas and gripped the steering wheel ten and two. The boards shuddered under the truck's weight, but did not give. Yahoo! Barb screamed on the way up the hill. I feel like we're in a movie. Meredy and Barb bought everything the grower had. Three fat black garbage bags full of raw shake. 30 pounds total. Crammed it into the cooler in the back of the truck and covered it with a tarp. They drove home and it was nervous, slow and careful. That much weed, they knew, could send them to prison for years. The first phone call between my parents was awkward, but Barb had prepared them both. I hear you're good with the tarot, Doug said. Well, you know, I'm trained to read auras. You know, since we're both into psychic work, why don't we exchange readings? Let's skip all the bullshit and pretension and find out who we really are. <laughs> he laughed in a way that made it sound like an adventure. Meredy liked to put her skills forward first, and she was confident with the tarot. No matter what else happened, she figured she could give a decent reading. They agreed that Doug would come to her house first. Then the following day, he'd read her aura in his warehouse, tit for tat. No coffee. No concert in the park, no wine to break the ice. Just hardcore display of psychic chops. The hippie blind date par excellence. Four decades later, two loose pages of my dad's 1976 day planner surface in a box of old letters, offering a snapshot of his life. On November 8th, there's a dental appointment and the name Barbara Hartman circled the day they first met. Later that week, my dad has scheduled three psychic readings, including one with someone named Estania, and the parenthetical note, spiritual sexual union. I don't know what that entails. And maybe it's for the best, but it's clear that my dad was making a go at becoming a professional. It might seem outlandish in any other time or place, but psychic work, was serious business in the Bay Area in 1976. Multiple cities were embroiled in debates over the legalities of psychic services. The ACLU was suing the city of San Francisco over the right of palmists and other occult practitioners to advertise their services. And the California State Senate was holding hearings on a bill to set up a statewide licensing program for astrologers. On Sunday, November 14th, Doug planned to fast, take mushrooms, and see a double feature of The Exorcist and The Other. Then on Tuesday, November 16th, there's Meredy Dominance's name along with her address and phone number and the note, 8 p.m. reading with. 
I have this clear image of the first time I saw your mother, my dad says, looking back. Her apartment was up these long, narrow Victorian stairs, and she was standing at the top with the light from the door shining behind her. I had to climb all the way up there to reach her. She didn't budge, like to meet me halfway or anything. It seemed like it took a really long time. She was like no one I'd ever met before, that's for sure. Meredy eyeballed her date as he climbed the stairs, thinking that Barb certainly had fixed her up with a good-looking guy. Doug had a full reddish beard, a strong straight nose, high cheekbones, freckles, and light blue eyes. He was tall, lean, and loose-limbed. At the top of the stairs, he removed his leather cowboy hat, revealing a shiny bald crown like that of a much older man, though his skin was smooth and youthful. She led him into her bedroom, which she'd obsessively cleaned and arranged to perfect the gypsy boudoir vibe, replete with incense and candles. She dressed simply in jeans and a slimming black turtleneck with an oversized ank necklace. Her eyes were elaborately cold and shadowed. Meredy chattered to fill the silence while showing Doug her latest artwork, mostly watercolors. The conversation began haltingly, but art loosened both of their tongues. They fell into a natural one-upmanship, each waxing about their own creative obsessions. For the reading, they sat facing each other on Meredy's queen-size bed. She felt a little intimidated. Doug was so cute and seemed to fit her parameters. She took deep breaths to clear her mind. Once she hit her stride in the reading, she relaxed and let the cards guide her. I wish I knew what my mom saw in the cards that night, but all she remembers is congratulating herself on giving him a good reading. My dad isn't any more helpful, his memory coming up blank. Did she draw the lovers and get distracted by a fluttering in her stomach, wondering if the lover in question might be her? Did she see opportunity on his horizon, maybe the Ten of Pinnacles? A hint that he was about to go from chronically broke to joining an increasingly lucrative illegal enterprise that would sustain him for years? Did she glean from the Empress card that he would soon create a child? It's also possible that she saw none of this. Her reading totally off the mark, blinded by attraction. Doug left at midnight in a white VW notchback. From her window, Meredy watched the taillights shrink, then flare before vanishing around the corner. They had agreed that she would visit him at his warehouse the next day for her Berkeley Psychic Institute style aura reading. She lay awake for hours after he was gone, replaying the evening. The next day, Meredith's footsteps boomed through the barn-like warehouse at 31170 20th Street. Its floors were of rough, unvarnished wood, and its ceiling soared high overhead. Skylights flooded the space with natural light. Freestanding walls, half-built rooms, and makeshift partitions, art everywhere. Doug showed her his visionary artwork, the large triptych Barb had described in a series of mandalas. His use of vivid color turned her on. In an open central space, Doug set up two chairs facing, facing each other and directed her to sit, legs uncrossed, hands on knees. He closed his pale blue eyes. I want you to ground yourself, he said. Envision a blue cord running the length of your spine down through the floor and the building's foundation into the earth itself. Plug yourself into the source. He took long breaths through his nose, his features slackening. Moments passed, a truck backfired outside, then Doug extended the fingers of one hand towards Meredith's lap. This 
is the root chakra that connects you to Mother Earth. If anyone has hooked a cord into your root chakra, we are going to detach it right now and send them on their way. He flicked his wrists to the right and Meredith felt a lightness through her lower torso and groin. He moved up through the seven chakras, cleaning each one in turn. As he went, he mentioned images and feelings he found there. At one point, he smiled slightly. I'm getting a clear picture of Shirley Temple, he said. A pudgy little girl in tap shoes trying to win the world over with a giggle. Meredith had indeed looked like a brunette version of Shirley Temple as a kid. She'd taken tap lessons throughout her childhood, and she still saw herself that way, as a beaming, curly-haired stage hog dancing to make the city smile. He couldn't have known her that well, and yet he did. The reading left Mare's brain buzzing, a vibration around her third eye, so intense it was slightly painful, like coming down from an acid trip. She felt spacey and exhausted, but wide open. She expected Doug to ask her for a real date. Now that they'd plumbed the depths, they could take a step back and have a little fun. But if Doug's finest characteristics were on display in those first interactions, his worst were not far behind. Apropos of nothing, he said, you know, Meredith, I was going to ask you on a date, but I'm going to have to reconsider. You're holding on to too much and it shows. You need to lose the weight. Stunned and hurt, Meredith left quickly. No time to mope. With Thanksgiving coming up, advance orders, orders for brownies rolled in. She kept busy, but that didn't stop her from obsessively thinking about comebacks. Mentally, she gave him a whole different type of reading. A few days later, Doug called with no mention of his rude comment. He asked her out to dinner. In spite of herself, Meredith didn't turn him down. They sat in the window seat of an in inexpensive Chinese restaurant. Meredith felt fidgety under Doug's iceberg eyes, beautiful, ethereal eyes, somewhat distant. Meredith ate what was on her plate slowly, don't be a piggy, but didn't take a second serving she wanted and toyed with the soy sauce and chili bottles instead as he gobbled the rest of the chicken lo mein. They'd shared a brownie and a little Coke before dinner, which made them both talkative. Meredith told Doug about her travels in Europe and Morocco and how she'd nearly married a Berber. She spun a yarn about narrowly escaping a gangbang in Florida, turning it into an adventure story, a laugh riot. Doug deepened his own story in response. His father, a brilliant Navy engineer who taught at MIT, had died in a freak drowning accident on a salvage dive in Pearl Harbor. Doug was only five. I grew up fatherless, he said, surrounded by strong women with no men anywhere. Sometimes I don't know how a man is supposed to act. I don't always say the right thing. You might have noticed that. Not an apology exactly, but Mary decided it was an attempt at one. After his father's death, Doug's mother took her sons to England, where she enrolled them in boarding school. Homewood House was hulking castle-like stone structure originally occupied by Queen Victoria's gynecologist. Let me tell you, Doug said, that place was cold on every level. Art has been his refuge. All the other boys would be out playing sports, which I never ever did, and I'd be in the art department on my lunch break. Meredith felt herself softening. Wasn't everyone a little broken? Weren't they all doing the best they could? Doug had eventually entered a fine arts program at UC Berkeley with a full scholarship, but he dropped out in 1975, months before he would have graduated. I had this painting teacher who was all about modernism and understatement, he said. He didn't get my work. And you know what? Fuck that. 
I went to the Berkeley Psychic Institute instead. An uncompromising artist. Finally. The first week I spent with your mother, my dad says, looking back. I did greater quantities and more kinds of drugs than I had done my entire life up to that point. I remember coming to a point, maybe we were experimenting with brownies or something, of lying on the kitchen floor. I was totally wiped out, totally unable to stand. All I could do was lie there on the linoleum and I was laughing, rolling on the ground and laughing with total abandon. They had gotten off to a rocky start, but my parents found a lot of common ground. They were both bright, sensitive, and creative, rollicking full throttle through their lives. Maybe they were too similar. As artists, they would become natural rivals, mutually inspiring, but also resentful of each other's accomplishments. The seeds of destruction nestled inside love's first bloom. After dinner at the Chinese restaurant, they went back to Meredith's flat in the Haight and had sex for the first time. It was awkward, eager, intense. They fell asleep lying side by side in guttering candlelight. The room wreathed with incense. Meredith awoke in the lightness, er, lightless early morning with her bed violently shaking. <gasps> Earthquake, she gasped, sitting bolt upright, but the room was still. Nothing rattled, nothing toppled. Doug thrashed beside her under the blankets. Hey, hey, Doug, she nudged his shoulder and found it slick with sweat. Grabbing his bicep, she tried to squeeze him awake. He made gurgling sounds, then stilled. Was he having some kind of an overdose? She flicked on her light, ready to call an ambulance. And there was Doug, expression placid, his breathing regular. She watched him swallow, his Adam's apple sliding up his throat and back down, sleeping like an angel. Hey, Doug, you okay? He murmured and rolled away toward the wall. She watched him for a while, then clicked the light back off and pulled the covers up to her chin. The sheets were soaked with cooling sweat. She didn't sleep again till sunrise. Over coffee that morning, Meredy waited for Doug to mention something, anything, about the night before, but he seemed mysteriously detached. He sat at the kitchen table, flipping through a book of Aubrey Beardsley prints. Mare's attempts at conversation fell flat. Typical, she thought. Wham, bam, freak out on your bed. Thank you, ma'am. Donald padded into the kitchen for his morning coffee. Seeing Doug there, he smiled knowingly. Good morning, you two. Nice night. Meredy narrowed her eyes at Donald. He pursed his lips and took his mug into his room. So, Meredy ventured, you slept really rough. You were kind of kicking in your sleep. Did you have a bad dream? Doug didn't respond at all, apparently too absorbed in the book. Hey, hello there, <laughs> Doug. His eyes snapped into focus. You were kicking in your sleep. Seemed like you had a bad dream. Is everything okay? I'm fine, he said with complete nonchalance. No dreams I remember. Men could be so damned cold. The night suddenly seemed like a mistake. But Doug warmed up after coffee and a joint. As he prepared to leave mid-morning, he planted a sweet enough kiss on Mare's lips to make her feel floaty throughout the day. Not until late afternoon, when the smell set in, did she realize that he had urinated in her bed. Yay, well done, well done. Thank you, thing. thank you. <laughs>
such a good i i can't wait to read the book i <laughs> i love the i love the excerpt it's so good this is um yes this is very it's very surreal to hear somebody else <laughs> <read it. laughs> um thank you so much that was beautiful oh thank you thank, yeah thank you your work, I, <laughs> your work is so vivid and like engaging and it just it really it really pops off the page it's really fun to read it's really fun thank you yeah. um well i have to say i wouldn't i wouldn't be able to include this level of detail without the full the full participation of my parents <laughs> who might very well regret it at this point but <laughs> but there we are so i think i heard I heard part of a conversation earlier where you were saying that you're the same age. I think so. Well, this story takes place the exact month and year I was born. I was born November 20th, 1976. Oh my goodness. Okay. So <laughs> we're of a very similar age. Absolutely. <laughs> were your parents, what, what were your parents like? My parents are in the room. <laughs> so <I'll> be... <laughs> you don't have to tell, you don't have to tell us about the first time. Hi mom. Hi dad. Um, they 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 were like very much what they're like now um they uh you know i was raised not not necessarily as an outlaw but definitely as um an alternate like an alternative culture kind of kid um we were the only vegetarians i knew <laughs> and um my my parents were always really uh you know incredibly on the liberal sides side of politics um on the progressive side of politics and so my ideas about how the world should be were very you know very formed very clearly at a young age in that in that shape of things where where i i was able to see what they were trying to show me and i have to say i'm pretty I, i'm pretty grateful for it at this point <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am. Yeah, I am. I am too. Do you <laughs> do you know the nitty gritty of how they connected? And if not, does this make you curious? Yes, it does make me curious. I, I will say they have told us a bit about the story. Um, they were both married to other people when they met. Oh, there's a story. <laughs> <laughs> so that was something different. Um, I remember very clearly that we went to, they worked at Caltech together. My dad was doing his PhD. I'm a Davis kid. And, uh, <laughs> and my mom was uh, working in the labs there. Um, and they actually, when we went down there to Pasadena, they showed me the bench that my dad proposed to her at, um, which is still there um, as is his lab and, and their old homes that they used to live in in Pasadena and Altadena. So yeah, it, it's pretty cool. I love thinking when you grow older, I don't know, how do you feel about knowing your parents as people? You know what I mean? Like really understanding them as real people. How does that strike you having gone through this process? Um, per personally, I love it. I, um, I feel that I've grown a lot closer to my parents through this process and, um, you know, there's, there's a certain, between parent and child, I think there's a certain automatic disconnect where you have this relationship of teacher and, and pupil that it's kind of dis dictated from, by society, it's dictated by society. And in reality, you're both teaching each other. And mm -hmm. so my parents had this very unorthodox way of, of looking at it, where I think even as a, even as a kid, there was kind of the idea in my household that we would teach each other. I think that was always part of our oh, I love that. family uh, ethos in a way. Um, and maybe this is, a, this is an evolution of, of that, but somehow I think that I'm able to respect them more and mm -hmm. learn from them better Yeah, when there isn't that kind of hierarchical difference between us. And, and maybe it's because I was raised to distrust authority. <laughs> you, can't, you can't tell me anything if you're going yeah. to place yourself above me, but if we're on the same level. 
I like that. I feel like this might be a good time to say that Doug is here and he has something to say also. So Doug, I think you're unmuted. So please go ahead. <laughs> yes, Hi. I'm unmuted. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Yes. Well, I just kind of bumped into the meeting. I knew it was going and I just happened to join it right at the juiciest time. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness. If you it's can a great imagine, punchline. If you can imagine your child revealing your most intimate <laughs> secrets of your relationship and how you met and what you did the first night and et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, it, it makes me remember that I'm only human. You no are one brave person. dude. That's <laughs> <laughs> no such thing as a perfect person. Thank I, you. <laughs> I had no idea you were you were here, but that that's <laughs> cool. um, no. But re, this is this is kind of this is neat uh, because as we're talking about this experience, one of the really one of the really spectacular and special aspects of it has been getting to know you, my dad, um, on a on a very personal level that I don't think we were able to do when I was a kid. And um, and it's been hmm. <laughs> I think she froze a little bit. Yeah, she she is. There she is. Uh -huh. oh, you're back. Am I moving again? No, you're uh, good. It's it's just been a profoundly. Oh, I'm getting notification. Can you see? Am I moving? You're doing fine. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting notifications that my <laughs> connection can is see and hear you. But it, it's been a it's been a profoundly um, important experience in my life to come to know especially my dad, but to come to know my parents as, as humans and to realize that these are both people who I would really like to be friends with. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I get to be friends with. <laughs> I relate to that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I live next door to my parents and I, I've gotten to know them as an adult much better. And Doug, I'm so glad you're here. It's so good to meet your voice. <laughs> Thank you. I did my best to, uh, <laughs> to, to. So you don't see me. <laughs> no, I don't see you. No, you have to turn on your camera. I think. Okay. <laughs> I don't see where to do that. It's down yeah. in the bottom left corner. If you bottom left it. corner, where it'll you'll see a little looks like a video. If you move your cursor down to the bottom left, it looks like a video camera, and it probably has a red line through it. And you want to click nah. that? Oh, there it is. No, I, it's, that's hey, not there it. You are. Hey, there I he is. Your, we see your neck. Really? <laughs> it says stop video. No, there you see are. Hi. Is that it? <laughs> Hi, hello. <laughs> <laughs> well, now that you know all my innermost, my deepest secrets, you might want to tell people why I was having that problem. Oh, yes, of course. This is a, this is a clearly part of this chapter. but <laughs> Kind of important. Um, but <laughs> but my dad has primal epilepsy and which is now very much controlled but at the time it was not so well controlled and so in the moment my mom my mom was not aware of what was happening and it became uh part of the intriguing enigma that is <laughs> Doug Boltz <laughs> am I right oh yeah oh yeah uh, I think, I think, I mean, I think in reality, it, it drew her more, you know, because it was this, it was mysterious and it was also very human. You know, we, we, we don't want to open our hearts to, to people who are not also, also flawed, right? So. I think that we have a problem in society in that people keep comparing themselves to perfect images that are illusion. Mm -hmm. And it's much more important to accept the reality of who we are. Here, here. <laughs> if I might say that. Because oh, that's, the, <laughs> that's the real person. Hi, 
What? Are you? Oh, is your mom here? Yeah, she just popped on. <laughs> <laughs> I was traveling incognito there for a while. Cool. <laughs> yeah, Doug, I really agree with that. That's a, a very wise thing to say, I think. Um, well, that's something I got from the Berkeley Psychic Institute. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I, I, it wasn't the smartest move to leave UC Berkeley having my, you know, my whole career paid for. So my mother was not exactly happy when I did that. But the positive was I joined the Berkeley Psychic Institute and my life changed. So. <laughs> <laughs> the silver lining. <laughs> yeah. And you never would have painted that triptych if you hadn't gone to the, right? The Berkeley Psychic Institute. Uh, what it, trip? The one with the wo woman sitting in the chair. Oh, sitting in the chair. It yes, sounds beautiful. Was, I'd, love, I'd love to see it. <laughs> she was in my class. That's so cool. She was also my girlfriend for a while, but uh, yes. So she's reading the person who's looking at the painting. Ah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I haven't stopped there. I keep on going, so. And, um, and Doug, Alia recently shared a, a, a massive painting you recently com completed. Yes. <laughs> Can you just tell us? We don't have a lot of time, but I, yeah. I want to direct people. We got to find a way to share it. And if you would just tell us a little bit about it, too, because I, I think okay. that Alia honors your and Meredith's art so well and your artistic you. instincts. So, Part of the problem about that painting is that I don't have a whole photograph of it. I haven't been able to get it out of my studio yet. So it's I have gigantic. pieces that mix together. Yes, it's seven feet by 12 feet. And the thing about it is it was started in 1975 or six in the studio, in the warehouse that we were living in in San Francisco when Stiff, Sticky Fingers was happening. So when we left San Francisco, the gentleman who is jumping across, he was a ballet dancer from the San Francisco Ballet, and that's what I had painted. And then just uh, about two weeks ago, I finally finished the painting 40, 45 years later. <laughs> and um, very powerful. It's called Crossing the Great Water. It's about making a change in your life from a negative place into a positive place. Beautiful. And that's a lifelong process. It is. So a 40 year process in this particular case, but, but aren't we all, you know, aren't we all laboring on that? I love yeah. that, um, that we get to enjoy this, this memoir that's also like the most fantastic, just storytelling of a period of history and vivid specific people, but also that for all the writers in this, zoom room it really is from all three of you you and your parents and all of your friends it's very much about reinvention and imagination and execution it's it's really been an honor to have you here tonight and i i would be remiss if not to say before i turn it back to dorothy that dorothy rice my co-director has also written memoirs about uh, that include her life as the child of an artist. Her first uh, book, which is a sort of an essay memoir about her dad is called The Reluctant Artist. So I think he's kind of like the opposite of Doug Bowles, who's so open and sharing about it. And, and um, Dorothy's book, which is fantastic, is about someone who kept his art private, extremely private. So. I hope you don't mind my bouncing it back to you, Dorothy. No, but uh, yeah, it couldn't have been written while he was alive. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Would not have appreciated it. I, I can feel him, uh, you know, <laughs> throwing darts down from wherever he is. But not really. I you feel know, you never know. I have to say, I didn't think that it would go this well. <laughs> 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 no, this is amazing to uh, have the the family here that's that's wonderful yeah i'm i'm, I'm envious <laughs> it, it's very it's very powerful and sweet anyway yeah we do have questions from folks for you uh, alia i noticed one in the chat from uh anara i don't know if you want to um rephrase your question anara or if you'd like me to 
uh, scoot back and, and read it. It was a ways back in the chat. Uh, are you with us, Anara? Yeah, I'm here. And um, yeah, I wanted to, I thought it was so unusual to write a memoir in which it wasn't your memoir as much as your parents. And of course you had their cooperation and, and people around them. But I wondered what was the most surprising thing that you learned in doing this very unusual memoir technique? Um, well, there were there were a lot of surprises. It's uh, it's it's kind of hard to narrow it down um, to just one because there were quite a few. I will say that in deciding to write this memoir, I started out not thinking of it as a memoir. I thought of it more as a cultural history, and more as a um, as it was an oral history was the earliest form that it took where I just interviewed people and, and wove those together. So um, the, memoir, the memoiristic aspects of it kind of came later because I, I realized that it needed an, el an element to hold the whole thing together. But I was really very interested in chronicling this history. I was surprised, I think most surprised to find out how much of how how pioneering uh, the sticky fingers is actually is my dad's art right here a, a really early pen and ink version of it um, but I was really surprised to find out how pioneering this business was growing up inside that world because it was the underground it's not like we were in communication with other cannabis people and so I always assumed there were more people doing a similar kind of thing. But as I really dug into the research, I realized that that my parents were very early to be operating at that kind of scale and the kind of model. So that that was a cool thing that I was able to inform them of <laughs> in a way because they they didn't know it as well. And my, my mom wasn't really wasn't aware of her role in medical marijuana, um, how really how pioneering that was in its day during the AIDS, AIDS crisis. So, um, so that was all exciting to discover. Yeah, wow, like learning the Thank bigger you. context. Yeah, mm -hmm. it looks like um, Amanda. Amanda has two questions for you. One about the painting uh, and the other about your writing group. Um, you wanna jump in, Amanda? Sure, hi, Alia and Doug. I just wanna say that that giant painting, it's just off the charts. I hope to goodness it has a big buyer soon because it's really <laughs> something. If I had the dough, it would come home with me. Uh, so congratulations. Hey, Ali. I'd like, to, I'd like to put it in a museum. Yeah, exactly. I, I'd like it to be somewhere where everybody would have access to it. Let me tell you, I want to see it next to the Mark Tanzi at the Met in New York City. Ooh, okay. <laughs> you and Mark Tanzi, right together, it'll be great. I'll send you, I'll send Ali a copy of that painting because they'd be great together. Excellent. Okay. Um, Ali, you know, um, fellow writer, how do you, how does your um, writing group organize itself? How do you guys work together? Do you trade pages? How do, how do you do that? Sure. Uh, so I, I have a very long standing writing group. We started working together in about 2007 or eight and the cast of characters changes a lot there is one person really who joined very early and and myself and we're still doing it and everyone else has sort of rotated but um but what we have is a methodology so we every two weeks we meet and we have a certain number of pages that the that the group is able to read every week and this kind of is an, has been a negotiation over the years but um uh everyone in the group is in is invited to submit up to a maximum of 5000 pages to a certain limit basically put it short everyone reads in advance we make notes on the manuscript very good line notes and um we give verbal critiques every other week so it, it's kind of it, there's a lot of labor involved in it but it's uh it's a really good it's a good group it's a small group we all know each other well and that every other week deadline that i should have i should have a chapter or a significant revision ready every two weeks that's what finishes a book for me 
Yeah. Thanks, that was really helpful. Great, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, you can either raise your hand or, or put it in the chat. Ah, what's next? What's next? <laughs> I, I'm working on another family story. Uh, and this one is about my dad's side of the family. Oh, he just made himself invisible. I thought he'd want to stick around for this. <laughs> uh, so my, my paternal great grandmother married a ghost in her elder years. And this is kind of, the story is kind of teased in Home Baked. But she lived in marital uni union with an invisible man for 40 years. And um, so this, and she wrote a memoir about it. She's written two memoirs, both of which are like 500 pages. So I have all of this source material. And I'm, and I'm working on a story that um, looks, at, looks at this relationship, whether it's real or imagined, um, and also that looks at her life leading up to it. There's a real feminist angle to the whole story and her reasons for having this highly, you know, highly romantic and sexual relationship in her elder years. I feel like the sexuality of elders is something that, that kind of doesn't get talked about, certainly not in this country. And so that's something that I'm interested in exploring through a ghost. <laughs> and that, that, that's, that's basically what I'm working on in a nutshell. Uh, sounds amazing. Can't <laughs> wait. Any other thoughts? Anybody? Wonderful. It's hard when there's more than one screen, you have to scroll to see if you're missing anyone. Yeah. And Anara says supernatural sex. Yeah, that'll be fun. <laughs> you could create a new genre. <laughs> there is a genre. I, I, it's, it's a very, very, very active genre. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not usually nonfiction. <laughs> yeah, that's what I meant. The meld of romance and uh, supernatural and uh, yeah. all of these things uh, together yeah. would be. So your own. I guess I'm. I guess I'm combining the supernatural romance novel genre with the kind of investigative, <laughs> uh, big picture, culture minded nonfiction work that I do, and I'm trying to make the whole damn thing stick together. And so far, it's not. But yeah. that's what I'm working like on. A new genre, a new a new mashup. That sounds great. Um, all righty. Well, with that, I do want to remind everyone about the workshop uh, that Alia will be giving tomorrow from one to four. It's uh, only fifty dollars, and I know I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I can find the link again, or if someone can, we can repost it in the chat. You can also just go to storiesonstage.org and the links are there. Um, also purchase the book. Uh, it's wonderful. You'll enjoy it if you haven't yet. Um, any closing words you want, Alia? <laughs> This, this has been a real treat. I, d I just want to say thank you. I'm very honored. And Megan, you did such a wonderful performance. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. This is, um, you know, we do, as, as we were talking about earlier, we do this labor in, in private, in our, in our funky old sweatpants. And it, even though we're still kept separate um, for the moment, uh, because of the pandemic, it is it is an honor and a privilege and a joy to get together with you all in this way. And um, <laughs> thank thank you, Dad, for <laughs> for coming yeah. and participating. <laughs> Made it really special. It, it was wonderful, and um, uh, Jessica has kindly reposted the link to uh, tomorrow's um, workshop as well as uh, Megan's um, website. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, check those things out. Also wanted to mention that our um, author uh, next month, May 28, is uh, Nancy Johnson with The Kindest Lie. I haven't, I just got it today. I haven't read it yet, but I'm looking forward to that. Love and that you, book. Yeah. You've read it? Nancy's oh, wonderful. Great. This is yeah, great. yeah. I, I read that it was the um, New York Public Library read of the day yesterday or something like that. So that's pretty big deal. <laughs> <laughs> New York Public Library, a very cool place. And one last chance, if anyone would like to be, have their name entered into a uh, an informal raffle for a uh, Sticky Fingers t-shirt, which I guess um, Doug designed the, the artwork, right? Mm -hmm. that, all, that sketch behind you. Yeah, just um, throw your name in the chat and I'll add you to the 
the bowl and be in touch later. All righty. Uh, anything you want to add, Shelly or Jessica or Sue? I just want to say what a delight it was. We knew we'd have Alia. We didn't know we'd have Doug. I suspect that Alia's husband is lurking out there quietly also. That's a disappointment. We didn't hear his voice or see his face, but it's really great. And also Megan's family too. It's really